Please remain standing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get your Bibles, get your Bibles, and turn with me to the book of Matthew. One verse, Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 26. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 26. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And I want to lift this one verse for your hearing. He's been talking about all kinds of worldly things and worldly people. But he comes to this. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Today I want to speak for just a few minutes. Live like you were dying. Live like you were dying. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Live like you were dying. I thank Elba Ford for being obedient. I've asked her to, to preach and teach about giving. Because so many people are in bondage about it, and sometimes I know I was. And then I found out, man, it wasn't about materials, it wasn't about church, it wasn't about religion, it wasn't about the pastor asking that he might put it on himself or do whatever he wanted to do with it. It was about my obedience and my faith in God's Word. Even as I think on this message today, I think about today, we are so preoccupied with profit and loss. We're so concerned with materialism. We're so concerned with having the best of the best. Uh, and, and the churches have gotten really caught up in the prosperity message so much sometimes that we make people think it's all about blabbing and grabbing. It's all about what you can get. It's all about you having the nicest things. And, 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 and sometimes it just, it's too much. Sometimes it's like we care more about money than we do about God. But we live in a culture uh, uh, that, that seems to talk about prosperity and there's nothing wrong with it but even as I hear our president talk every time he get hemmed up in a situation he points to the profit and loss of the stock market he says I'm showing you you're getting the best you've ever had but we cannot change or exchange our, our morality for money we cannot we cannot exchange uh, our salvations for savings and, and we, we cannot, we cannot look at material things, uh, the temporal things, and forget about the eternal things. Because we recognize that we were made triune beings. Uh, we, we, are, we have a spirit, soul, and body. And, and, and Jesus asked the disciples, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? He was talking about the soul of man. The whole battle is for our soul. We have a spirit. When we get saved, it is the spirit that is saved immediately. We receive a download of God's spirit right at the moment that we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart on the Lord Jesus that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. We recognize that. We believe that. But the soul and the body is saved day by day. So we recognize that sometimes, uh, uh, even though we've gotten uh, our spirit saved, uh, we are in conflict because I got the same old mindset, the same old proclivities, the same old habits, the same old hang-ups, and I'm saying I almost feel like I'm lying to everybody because I know I confess, I know I believe, but I don't feel different. Am I talking to anybody? You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the truth be told, I'm glad that everything that shows up in my mind doesn't show up on that screen. 
And so sometimes it's perplexing because you say, wait a minute, I know that I made that confession, but we have to understand that Jesus was talking to his disciples and he has given us this word for our learning. In chapter 16, he started off talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, two sworn enemies. They come together to stand against Jesus. They are sworn enemies of one another. The Pharisees, they are the ones that are pious and they like their ceremonies and they like their laws. They are the religious people. And the Sadducees, they're the, they're the uh, high levels of society. They, they have affluence. They have power. They, they have prestige. They're real worldly, and they don't really care that much about the things of God, but they up in the church, and many times they have the positions in the church. And these two come together, and they come against Jesus to test Jesus to see what he would say. And he calls them a wicked and an adulterous generation because they're seeking after a sign to say, when will the end be? And what I want you to know that we all should be thinking about when the end should be. Today I received a text message this morning from one of the pastors, and he sent it out to all the pastors in the group. And he said, this morning when you get up to read this message, think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for you and go ahead and give God a praise from your heart. And I read that message and I was thinking about the message I'm preaching today to live like you were dying, like this could be your last day. What if it was your last day? What if what if you don't even make it home this afternoon? I pray that's not the case, but what if it were your last day? And as I was reading the message, I thought, God, thank you that I'm alive to be able to read this message. I'm still among the living, and I thought it was a, I, I didn't lay down last night wondering if I'd wake up this morning. But that was all in God's hands. And I never thought about it, but when I heard his message, I thought, man, what if he had taken me home last night? What in my life would matter more to me than knowing Jesus? What matters more to you than, no, what would it change about the way you live right now? Would you stop holding on to the grudge you got with your sister? Would you, would you, would you commit completely to the things of God? What if you were on your last day today? What if you were on your last day today? Jesus in chapter 16 is talking to his disciples and he's thinking man they've been with him all this time but they still haven't come to the reality of who he really is he he, he says wait a minute he says I want you disciples he says beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees these jokers think wait a minute why did Jesus say beware of the leaven is it because we didn't bring any bread and Jesus is saying to him oh ye of little faith you still haven't begun to see in the spiritual realm what do you think I made bread I, I fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves I, I fed uh, 4,000 with seven and I had seven baskets left do you still, are you still so blind that you cannot see that I am the bread? Is there anything too hard? He's talking to his disciples because when he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, beware of their teaching. Beware, be, be, be aware of of their religion and thinking calls you in the church that that makes it right man you can be in church and in hell tonight he says he says I don't want you to get caught up in this religious thing he said I don't want you to be pious in your religion and, and the, the fact that you come to church every Sunday the devil does too 
the, the fact that you know scripture the fact that you have a position in the body he had one too he's saying to them I need you to he's saying I want you to think about not the things that are materialistic I want you to think on those things that are eternal because you need to start living as if you are dying because we are we are we are. We heard the young lady talk about her testimony. She gave us an insight to her personal journey. We are all on a journey. And where will you invest your life? And what will you invest your life in to get the greatest gain or the greatest return on your investment? Many of us on tomorrow, we will go and we will invest our lives on a job and we already know what we're going to get back per hour. And we are more committed to that than we are to the thing that's eternal to the heavens. And, and, and what are you investing your life in? And, and, and what is the return? Or is the fact that they give you an extra zero on your annual income, that is enough because money can answer all things except eternity. It can answer all things except eternity. Jesus said to them, lay not up for yourselves treasures, upon earth but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven God has a layaway plan and he says you can begin to take these things out of layaway when you get to eternity he says but if you have laid nothing up then you can get nothing out and he's trying to make sure that we don't get so caught up in this materialistic grab it and, and, and prosperity that you say, I don't, I cannot give to you, Christ, and still get what I want to get. And, and he lets us know. He says, no, if you want to gain your life, you have to be willing to lose it. When she sat there in the place of indecision, seeing whether she would be obedient to the word that she knew, like all of us have to come to, it wasn't about finances, it wasn't about Elder Ford, it wasn't about Pastor Campbell, it was about her and her relationship with the Almighty. And every one of us must come to that place and we seem to think that money will make us happy. But I still remember when I was a kid, I thought, man, I, did, I was always broke. And I thought when I got older and when I had money, I was going to always walk around with me $100 in my pocket. I got me a $100 bill. I folded it up and kept it in there. It just made me feel good, made me feel good. And then as I got older and older and had more and more, that $100 couldn't buy hardly anything. And it can buy nothing in the way of eternity. Some of us are unhappy because of the place that we're in. And he says, when you got Christ, he says, whatever place you find yourself, you can be content because you got the lover of your soul. You got the provider. You got the keeper. He... he he learns how to, uh, to give you what you need, when you need it, not because you want it. He said because you need it. Sometimes we get messed up because he hadn't given us what we want. And sometimes he's not giving you what you want at the time that you want it because it would mess you up if you got it now. It would mess you up if you got the brand new car at 17 and you hadn't worked for it. It would mess you up if he gave you a house, but yet you're behind in your rent payment in your apartment. It would mess you up. It, it would mess you with, are not ready for the blessing. Sometimes we've got to recognize I saw something on uh, Facebook about a month ago. It, 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 it was so awesome. I, I, I wanted to share it with you. It, it was about Steve Jobs, and he was on his deathbed. Seven billion, with a B, 
dollars. Seven billion dollars. Let's see what he had to say on his deathbed with all that money. I have come to the pinnacle of success in business. In the eyes of others, my life has been the symbol of success. However, apart from work, I have little joy. Finally, my wealth is simply a fact to which I am accustomed. At this time, lying on the hospital bed and remembering all my life, I realize that all the accolades and riches of which I was once so proud, have become insignificant, with my imminent death. In the dark, when I look at green lights, of the equipment for artificial respiration and feel the buzz of their mechanical sounds, I can feel the breath of my approaching death looming over me. Only now do I understand that once you accumulate enough money for the rest of your life, you have to pursue objectives that are not related to wealth. It should be something more important, for example, stories of love, art, dreams of my childhood. No, stop pursuing wealth, it can only make a person into a twisted being, just like me. God has made us one way, we can feel the love in the heart of each of us, and not illusions built by fame or money, like I made in my life, I cannot take them with me. I can only take with me the memories that were strengthened by love. This is the true wealth that will follow you, will accompany you, he will give strength and light to go ahead. Love can travel thousands of miles and so life has no limits. Move to where you want to go. Strive to reach the goals you want to achieve. Everything is in your heart and in your hands. What is the world's most expensive bed? The hospital bed. You, if you have money, you can hire someone to drive your car, but you cannot hire someone to take your illness that is killing you. Material things lost can be found. But one thing you can never find once you have lost it, is life. Whatever stage of life where we are right now, at the end we will have to face the day when the curtain falls. Please treasure your family love, love for your spouse, love for your friends. Treat everyone well and stay friendly with your neighbors. Moments after speaking these words, that he had asked to be written down, Steve Jobs, aged 56, passed away. Jobs said the most expensive bed is the hospital bed. The most expensive bed. And, and in his writings, he would say, you know, um, uh, whether you have a $30,000 house or $3 million house, it's still lonely if you're not there with people that love you. He, 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 he said some things. He, he said that we need to watch how we live. He said, he says, um, he says, eat food like medicine, or you'll eat medicine like food. I said, who this dude is on to something? He says, it, 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 sometimes we get so caught up into what we have, he, and he says, it doesn't matter whether you have a, a $30 Timex or a $30,000 Rolex, you cannot add one minute to your life. And, and, and at some point, what he realized is he had put all of his emphasis on getting materials at the end of it. He found out that like Solomon, it was vanity, vanity, vanity. We need to live like we're dying. Man, what would that change right now? What would that change in your heart? What would that change in your disposition? What would that change? What would, what would it change? Would you apologize? Would you reconcile? Would you, would, you, would you do some things different because you need to live like you're dying because we are? Jesus told him, don't have any faith in religious practices. But he says, faith is the right perspective to see our lives through. He says, because your faith is not 
predicated on physical sight, nor is it on current circumstances. Faith raises our perspective to God. See, what he was trying to say to his disciples who thought, wait a minute, there is a limit to who this man is even though they had seen all the miracles. They'd seen the water turned into wine. They'd seen the blind eyes open. They'd seen, they'd seen Peter's mother-in-law healed of the fever she had. They'd seen all of this stuff, but they still had not seen Jesus. Could it be that you're in the church and, and you're all around what he's doing? See, this young lady came up here and spoke something that was already happening around you, but you did not know it was going on. And there are others who are having encounters with God, but I want to ask you, what about you? What about you? What are you or is it just good enough to be here? Is it? Uh, but faith raises our perspective. Every time you raise your, your, your spiritual perspective, you mature in your faith. Because Abraham believed God, it was counted unto him righteousness. But when God told him and came to him, he says, I need you to leave your mother and your father and the things that you're comfortable with and go to a place that I will show you. I want you to know that God has taken us all on a spiritual journey and he keeps on giving us step after step. But he's trying to raise our perspective from the step to the father. He says, I need to raise your perspective so you can see in the spiritual realm. And his disciples, he said, oh, ye of little faith. How could you forget all that I've done? That you've forgotten that, man, I don't need bread. I am bread. He's trying to get us to understand. He's trying to get us to understand that it doesn't matter if you start focusing on the things of this world, but you don't focus on eternity, he said, because it won't profit you anything because you have the wrong perspective. Everything you see is temporal, and everything you do not see is eternal. What am I saying? The spirit of Christ and the spirit of the Antichrist, you can't see them, touch them, feel them, but they will be here long after we are gone. So it brings the disciples to the question that Jesus asked them. Who do you say the Son of Man is? I would ask you that question. Who do you say Jesus is? I know you knew him as a babe in the manger, but do you know him as a, the soul keeper? Do you know him as Abba, Father? Who do you say he is? That's what he asks you through the situations of your life. When you come to an impasse and you say, man, that's too big for me, you have to change your perspective and not look at what you can do, but look at the one that's greater than you can do. You have to raise your perspective and see not in the natural, but see in the spirit. Who do you say Jesus is? In your situation right now, who do you say he is? In your circumstance, who is Jesus in your life? Is that illness greater than him? Is that shortfall in your finances bigger than him? Is, is that situation wider than him? Who is he now? A lot of times God has taken us on the journey and we can't wait to get to the promised land. But I need you to know that many times God doesn't take you the straight route into the promised land. He takes you around about the way because you got to know there is growth in your trial, trials. There, there is strength in your struggle. There, there is a triumph in your trouble. God says, I'm not trying to get you to your promised land too quickly. He said, because you ain't ready for it. If you don't go through anything to get it, you can't stand against anything to keep it. Who do you say? And Peter says, thou art the Messiah, thou art the Christ, 
the son of the living God. Do you imagine how difficult that was to say? He's looking at a natural man, and he's saying, Thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And this is what I want you to understand. You cannot see who Jesus is in the natural. You have to see it by the Spirit. He said, Simon Bar-Jonah, flesh and blood, did not reveal to that to you. Many of us are trying to see who Jesus is, but you'll never see who he is in the natural. They are spiritually discerned. That means you have to raise your perspective and start thinking in a spiritual mindset. It goes against everything that you feel natural. It went, when that young lady talked about, I had my finger on the button, she's got all kinds of things coming against her in the natural, and she's trying to walk in a spiritual perspective. It won't be easy. If it's easy, then the enemy is not trying to fight you where the thing is easy. In fact, he opens the door to the easy so you'll never do the hard and get what God wants you to have. He doesn't put... He, the adversary don't guard the road that leads to destruction. If it's too easy, you got to stop and check. You could be getting set up. If it's too good to be true. That's too good to be true. You ever met somebody, you said, man, that dude, that girl, she got, oh, man, that, that, you check it. Check it. He just too good. Mm -hmm. Spend that $49 and do a background check. Check it. Check it. Check it. Y'all know how you do. $29.99. You can, you can find out who she really is. You won't be her first or her last sugar daddy. But what we find out, difficulty will always make us question who Jesus is. It will always, uh, it makes us question, it really makes us question, can I, she had a finger, can I trust what he said? Can I trust that he'll never leave me or forsake me? Man, I feel mighty alone right now. Can, wait, wait, can, can I trust, can I? Can, 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 can I forgive them and they and seven times 70? Oh, I don't think so. Can how I'm gonna make ends meet when I ain't got everything I need and you telling me to put you first? I don't know if I can trust that. It's not logical, it's not sequential, but I've got to live as if I'm not just living for today, I'm living for eternity. And so I've got to put my trust in one of two things, either in me or in him. Everybody say it's a process. Yeah, because I, I know I know you ain't there. I, I understand you may not, you may, you, this may be too much for you right now. It's a process, and I didn't get there overnight. You know my story. I couldn't tithe. I knew the principal. I asked my wife. I said, what, it, it, what, what, what is 10% of that? Like I didn't know. <laughs> I knew. Tom, I knew I just wasn't willing, bro. I knew. What, what, what is that, huh? Oh, don't say it. I'm melting. <laughs> But you have to have a faith framework to see the impossible possible. You have to have a different perspective. The Bible tells us, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and then lean not to what? Yeah, that ain't, y'all know that's a lot easier said. Lean not to my own understanding. In all of my ways, acknowledge him. Many 
of us are not willing to take the journey. You think that when God is directing you and you have to back up, something is wrong. The children marched around for 40 years until they got to the promised land and they had battles and they had positions where they had doubt and they had discouragement and disappointment. Everybody wants to be the champion. Don't nobody want to get off the canvas. Nobody wants to have to get knocked down and get up. But if you ain't never been knocked down, if you ain't never been disappointed, I wonder what just keeps you standing. There's very few people that have gotten to the, their destiny without being discouraged, without being disappointed. See, because as soon as you got saved, as soon as you confessed, your spirit was in the right place. But, but, but your, your, your soul and your, your body was not. And, and you know and I know that, that, that there's a battle going on on the inside of you. But you cannot let your old person stop you from your new purpose in God. You still got that old man, that old woman, that old man and that old woman still knows about the old tricks. Now you're trying to walk in the newness of life. The devil's still bringing back your old stuff. That's why when ain't nobody looking, you you know, you do what you used to do. And then you get all messed up. Because then you say, I know most of us have a spirit of hypocrisy. Most of us battle with it. You're not the only one. Paul said, when I would do good, evil was always present. See, when I first said that, you all got, you got self-righteous. You won't tell me. I got a spirit of hypocrisy. The, the fact that you thought that? The, 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 the thought that you got indignant because I said you were human? You old homo sapien. <laughs> yeah, we all are. So now we're in this battle. We're in this battle. Now we're trying to raise our spiritual perspective to walk in the spirit. But the question is, can I trust God in this situation? And I feel torn between what I know to do and what I feel like doing. And until I renew my mind with the word of God, until I stop leading to my own understanding, until I, I step out on faith, not on feelings. Feelings will jack you up. Step out, do the truth, even though you don't feel the truth. Why? Because I'm not looking for this that is just temporal. I'm looking for what's eternal. I'm living today like I'm dying. I know I don't always get it right. Man, I don't. I don't. And when I mess it up, the enemy tells me my whole life is a lie. I'm not the only one. When you mess up, you feel like, man, because here's the thing. I already know I'm battling. I already know that even when I do good, I didn't feel like doing it, but I did it. And you saw the fact that I did it, but you don't know that in between, inside I feel all messed up. So I did it, but the enemy is beating me up because my old person keeps rising up and saying, what you do that for? Now you're not going to have enough to make the ends meet. I told you. And then when you get in discouragement and despair, the enemy say, didn't I tell you? Did you hear her testimony? She said she started doing what was right, and it looked like all of her resources started evaporating. Anybody been there when you start trying to do what's right? Seem like, man, just when you started trying to do right, here it's like, wait, God, wait, wait. I've been praying for healing, and I get, you give me a diagnosis of cancer? You know my finances are sick, and I stepped out on faith, and you caused my a bill that I thought was paid it, it, the, the envelope dropped behind the refrigerator and now my credit is messed up. 
That was real. Trying to get our credit together, filled out the bill, fell down behind. We just, refrigerator, we get a note. Your mortgage is two months behind. I'm like, where the letters been? Well, I got the letters, but I didn't open them. Because I, I knew, my, I, you know, it's just the regular old bill come every month. It's like, ah, it's all right. It's all right. And we trying to get our stuff together. And, and, and then the next thing you know, year after year, you got to live down your old stuff. And you said, Some, the enemy has done this. But God needs us to be able to go this through discouragement to get to your destiny. There, don't look for the easy route. It is not there. It'll keep you right where you are. He says, Simon Bar Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. But it's interesting. Over in Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32. He just told Peter in Matthew 16, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I shall build the church, and then the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He says, No longer will I call you Simon. Simon means read, or uh, 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 the weakness of man. And, and, and he says, No longer will I call you that uh, intemperate thing that blows in the wind. He says, Now I'm going to call you Petros, a rock. And he says, Upon this rock, I'm going to build the church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Let me show you. It does not mean that God was going to build it on Peter. Mm -mm. He says, no, I'm not building it on you. He says, I'm building it on the revelation that you had. <laughs> he says, I'm going to build it on the fact that you could see that I am, I am the son of God, the living Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the promised one. He says, I'm going to build the church on faith in Jesus. And then later on, the Bible says that we now are living stones. So he says, Peter, upon your faith, upon your understanding of the word, I'm going to build the church. He's trying to build up you living stones in your faith so you can have a perspective just like Peter. That's a void, a, a void of what you see and feel and, and, and can taste in your senses. He says, I need you to discern in the spirit. It'll cause you to live for eternity. Now then, what messes me up is over in Luke 22, 31 through 32. He says, Simon, Simon. He calls him his name twice. This is the same one he just called Peter. He changed his name to Peter. Now he's calling him Simon. He's now talking to the old man. He says, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the storms don't come from the adversary. The enemy has to go and get permission from God to attack you. Come on, Job. The enemy has asked for permission to attack you. Can I tell you how you should take this? If God has allowed the enemy to attack you, He's already prepared you for whatever you need to get through the trial. He's already prepared you. Because when you go back to Job, he said, ha ha, where you been, devil? He said, to and fro, looking whom I might devour. He says, have you tried, Job? Wait a minute. He says, wait a minute. I know what I put in you, says the Lord. He says, you come against a strong mountain, but every trial that came before this one was a set up 
for your breakthrough was a set up for your victory. I know you've been knocked down before, but every time you got knocked down in the flesh, you got up in faith and you got up with a new perspective of who Christ is. Come on, somebody, give him about a 10-second praise break. Hey, God. Hallelujah. Hey, God. He said, I know what I put in you. Just like you as a parent know what you train your children to do. And what God says, I know what I put in you. Here comes the devil. He says, I don't do teaching unless there's going to be a test. And he says, listen, I need you to understand that you're not just fighting for what's here right now. You're fighting for what's to come. He says to Simon, he says, the devil desires to sift you as wheat. Put that passage up. Because I love this. I didn't, I just saw this. When I started looking at it, he says, but I have prayed for you. Go back to verse 31, Tiff. Thank you. He says, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. That word you, he, there's two words that, that the Bible uses. I, I just found this last night. He says, he has asked for you. That is the plural you. That he may sift you. That is the plural you. It's like being in North Carolina. He says, the devil has asked for y'all. That y'all, that he may sift y'all as wheat. Now look at verse 32. Peter is the one he's building the church. But I have prayed singularly for you, Peter. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Mess me up. He says, the devil has asked permission for y'all to sift y'all. But I have prayed for you. Mama, daddy, the devil is trying to get to your children, but he first has to come through you. He says, I, he's asked for y'all. He's asked for the other disciples. He said, but when you get up, Peter, you're going to be the first one to get up. And in the book of Acts, he's the first one when they're huddling in fear and, 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 and they're praying in the upper room. Peter gets up. He was afraid before, and he gets up. He had denied Jesus three times, and he gets up. And because he was strengthened, he then began to strengthen the others, and 3,000 were added to the church. I need you to know the devil has desired to sift your family, but he must first get you. He's got to come through you. Jesus didn't pray for y'all. He prayed for the set man. He prayed for the mother. He prayed for the father. He prayed for that one that was the leader of the others. He said, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Not your finances, not your health, not your mind, not your friendships. He says, I need to raise your perspective, Peter. He says, I'm trying to raise your perspective. He says, as you go, everything connected to you goes. And it may not be, a man of God may not be standing in the place spiritually of divine protection. It just may not. My wife was saved before me. And I put her through Hades. Had she fallen, I wouldn't be here today. God says, I'm trying to raise your perspective, your faith. I want you to know that it's bigger than right now. It's eternal. He says, I prayed for you. He said, that's why, that's why I wasn't in a hurry to get you to your promised land. 
He said, because I knew that fear could kill you. That's why I needed you to face some battles before you got to this. He says, he says, you cannot be risk averse in the spirit and think that you're ready to be a triumphant warrior. Too many of us are so risk adverse. We don't want to, when she had her finger on that button, she was taking a risk. I don't know what your risk is going to be. And you're going to have to weigh all of these things. And this is not about finances. This is about faith in your whatever area of your life. So what happens, though, is many times you don't need faith because you're the most outstanding supervisor in your branch. You, are, you got it going on, so you don't even pray. But I need you to know that when God knocks you to your knees, that's a good place to start praying. Sometimes he, he says, I can't get your attention any other way. I can't get you to bend your knee for nothing in the world. You're so proud and you're so arrogant because I've given you so much. Now you think it's about you. He says, I got to get your attention, Saul. I got to get your attention, Rob. I got to get you down to the place that you know it's not about you. It's always been about me in you working my will in your life. Somebody give him a praise. So when the enemy comes, he, even though God has given you a new name, the enemy will speak to your old man. He'll come in and speak, y'all better hear me. He'll come in and speak to the old you. Here you are in the church trying to do what's right, and every time you turn around, the enemy's bringing up your own nature. He got to, because have you realized who you are in Christ? He's done. He's done. But you've got to be willing to travel the roads of disappointments. You've got to be willing to travel the road of doubt. You've got to be willing to travel the road of discouragement to reach your destiny in Christ. And don't let the old person stop you from God's new purpose. The enemy knows our confidence cannot just be in us. It's got to be in him. We got to live like it's bigger than today. And so many times, we, we start dealing with things, and, 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 and tragedy can come, but it can make you better or bitter. Janelle, it can make you better or bitter. At the end of this life, this don't even matter. At the end of this life, when you think about eternity and you think about this life, it doesn't even compute. What if God decided to make you another Job with long hair and eyelashes? Back in Missouri, they call it Jobalina. What if he decided to make you Jobalina? Don't act, don't, don't even look like that, Lex. I hear you over there. What if he decided? Instead of Rob, Roberta. See, so many times, it's not that we, we fall short of the mark. It's that we stop aiming for it. We just get risk averse. And, and then here's the other thing, and I'll close with this because I thought I'd preach 35 minutes. We're a little bit over. God takes us through seasons, y'all. Too many of us want to stay in the summer where it's nice. And, and, but if you stayed in the summer, nothing would grow. But we keep looking for the summer where we can uh, take off our garb and, and go frolicking through life. But he gave us four seasons. 
and most of us are so focused on the summer, you need winter because there are times in winter where you lock everything out and you come in, begin to commune with God. There's winters coming in your life when you feel like nobody understands what you're going through but God. But as soon as we go through a winter, we all want to say, my season is up. I tried to live with that man. My season is up for all that. I done tried everything I know. It's time to move on. <laughs> As if God was going to give you a field that would not have winter, spring, summers, and fall. But when you change your perspective from the natural to the spiritual, you can be in the debt of winter and still have joy. Because the joy of the Lord, you can find yourself in the midst of trial, in the midst of persecution, and still have joy. I called out Chanel's name. She's going to do different things. And most of us would not even know it. I don't know. And God, I'm glad you gave it to her because she's got a joy that the world didn't give and a joy that the world can't take away, a joy that the doctors can't dampen, a joy that medicine can't kill. Why? It's the joy of the Lord. We have to live like we're dying. What if today, please stand to your feet. What if today was the last day? I don't want it to be. But what if it were? What is it that you keep on wrestling with? That God is saying, stop wrestling with that. Stop carrying that and cast your cares on me. Stop holding on to it and holding out, waiting for yourself to fix it and give it to me. Get your eyes off your flesh. Your feelings are, are leading you every which way. You're like a spiritual chameleon. Today you're high, tomorrow you low, the next day you're in between. We need to live like we're dying because we are we are what will it profit to have seven billion dollars and be another rich man in hell but the poor man Lazarus <laughs> he was in heaven on earth dogs licked at his wounds. Sometimes you, you can't look at what's going in your life like this is all there is. All you can do is do what you do as if unto the Lord. So when God asks you to do something that goes against your flesh but lines up with his word, do the truth. Do the word. Make the phone call. Apologize. Humble yourself. Say, I made a mistake. He, see, he, see, he says, I need you to understand the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. All these things are of the world. Sometimes your pride won't let you humble yourself and say, I was wrong. I messed up. I was wrong. I, I shouldn't have done that. I got to call him again, Lord. Yes, because it's not about him. It's about you. Ministers, please come.